Olá de novo. Hello again. Welcome for the last session of the morning. And I would like to call Professor Carlin de Leite to make the, to in, the introduction of Professor Claudia Mitchell, which is one of our uh, winners, laureates, um, uh, with the, the uh, Jose Vasconcelos Award of Education. So please, Professor Carlin de Leite. So, good morning, or oh, continuing uh, uh, good morning. And uh, I'm, um, I must say that I'm professor and researcher at the University of Porto. So, I'm greatly honored by this invitation from the University of Coimbra and Faculty of Psychology and Science of Education to present Professor Claudia Mitchell winner of the José Vasconcelos World Award Education. Thank you, thank you for giving me the honorable task of introducing Professor Claudia Mitchell and coordinating her lecture. As it is known, one of the prizes awarded by the World Culture Council is the José Vasconcelos World Award of Education. This prize is granted to a renowned educator, an authority in the teaching field, or someone who has brought about visionary development in education policy. This year, the awardee is Professor Claudia Mitchell, recognizing her commitment of it to education as an inspiring teacher and passionate advocate for youth, especially in transforming the lives of thousands of people from marginalized backgrounds. Congratulations, Professor Claudia Mitchell. Your work and its social quality are recognized by us all and deserve much applause, even before your lecture. <laughs> continuing, continuing, I must say that Professor Claudia Mitchell is a distinguished James Mark Gill professor at the Faculty of Education of Mark Gill University and director of the Institute of Human Development and Wellbeing. She is also an honorary professor in the School of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa, where she established the Center for Visual Methodology for Social Change. To highlight one of the many recognition of Professor Mitchell's work, I mentioned that in September 2015, the Royal Society of Canada recognized Professor Claudia as one of its fellows. Professor Claudia Mitchell's research interests are broad and marked by high social quality. I highlight, as an example, the work in schools with teachers and young people, particularly in the context of gender, age, HIV, and AIDS. She is also involved in South Africa, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Botswana, among others, education studies and interventions. Girl Good studies is another area of interest, especially in gender-based violence, violence. Staying on this theme, I mentioned the book Girlhood and the Police of Policy, um, of Place, sorry, which is a means the conditions in which girls live, learn, work, and play. This book deepens the worldwide understanding of girls and young people, human situation. 
I would also like to say that when I had Professor Claudia Mitchell biography, I found it very interesting how innovative visual and other heart-based methodologies started. While working with young um, AIDS patients in South Africa, Professor Claudia Michel realized how photography, video, performance, drawing, and written narrative contributed to their well-being. Professor Claudia Mitchell wrote many books and articles related to this focus, and participatory methodologies and social change, which uh, we are like to have and to read and to study. In sum, Professor Claudia Mitchell fulfills very well the World Cultural Council's mission, which is to increase efficient and positive use of knowledge and promote broaderhood among people, nations, and governments seeking true understanding among all, regardless of ideology, opinion, race, or gender. It is uh, with great interest that uh, all of us we listen to you, Professor Claudia Mitchell, uh, deliver the lecture entitled, This is How We See It, Studying Social Change with Young People. Professor Claudia Mitchell, please take the stage. Oh, good morning, everyone, and, th and thank you so much for those beautiful remarks. Um, and thank you to the University of Coimbra for being such a wonderful host to, uh, to us and to the World Culture uh, Council of Culture. And, of course, thank you to the, the WCC. And I echo my colleague, Vicky Caspi, that Lily Hernandez has been such a star in organizing all of this with so many other people as well, but really leading it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is such an honor to be here this morning to realize that I am surrounded, I believe, in this room with uh, so many people who are interested in, 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 in knowledge but in social change. I, I understand there are uh, students from the Faculty of Social Work, uh, new teachers, and I know there are young people in the audience as well. So it is triply, quadruply exciting to know that uh, we're all in this together in terms of how we think about uh, social change, how do we think about young people, and, and as um, our previous speaker said, the future of the world in so many, many, many ways. Um, what I would like to do this morning is um, talk a little bit about, well, the topic, how we see it, which very much fits with the notion of participatory visual methodologies, which is a, an area that is of particular concern to me as a sociologist and educator. What is, what, how do we see something? But it's also the perspectives. How, how, not only how do we see it literally through photography, through cell filming, through video, uh, through drawing, through performance, but also understanding seeing as perspectives on a particular issue, how we see it and the idea of studying social change with young people. I, there are many topics and many issues um, that I've looked at over the years, uh, but almost all of them have something to do with equity and particularly gender equity uh, and how we think about a fair world for everyone. Uh, and I thought today it would be particularly relevant. We are in the middle of uh, 16 days of activism as an international uh, campaign and I walked around the campus at, at 
at the University of Coimbra and seen many signs about, uh, about this intervention, of the, this international intervention on addressing violence over these 16 days between November 25th and December the 10th. So I thought it would be particularly relevant to bring together some of the work uh, around gender, gender-based violence, sexual and reproductive health rights in the context of young people and in the context of a framework for gender. I hope all of this will come together. Uh, I'm going to start just uh, putting a, a couple of, a, one slide really around the notion of gender transformation itself. Um, I've been working in the area of, of social change for many years, uh, but I find trying to find a framework that helps us think about how do we look at change and how do we look at, how do we look at change in a sustainable way. And I believe we've had some questions about sustainability already. So the notion of a gender transformative approach to thinking about sustainable change and equity for me is very, very critical. And I've just put, the, I, I did not invent a gender transformative approach as a strategy. Uh, a number of key feminist theorists, uh, Nellie Stromquist, uh, Carolyn Moser, uh, Kabila, many, many people who have come before me have talked about this, but I think within our large bodies of uh, international development, uh, this, this notion has been taken on, I think, in a, in a, in a really deliberate, deliberate way and a very intense way to think about how do we, how do we think about change in a sustainable way. And, and, and there are five or six characteristics, but I want to just highlight a couple now, and I will return to these during the talk. Um, we are not going to bring about social change, I don't think, in terms of equity, unless we have ways of hearing the voices of girls and women. And so throughout the talk, I will be, talking, I'll be looking at ways that this participatory agenda is absolutely critical. We also know that gender is not about girls and women, it's about everyone. And increasingly we will see, we should see, that boys and men are allies and champions of change. And throughout my talk, you're going to see boys and young men being part of this. Um, I also think intergenerationality is very, very important, and which is why I'm so happy that there are so many students here today, uh, that we have to think about this as something that is not just about one generation, but looking across generations. And the other point I want to just stress right now is the notion of personal transformation, that any of this work um, has to start and end with the people who are involved in it. Uh, it's a reflexive process, uh, and it's a process where we do not make changes overnight, necessarily. And some of the examples that I will look at today are things that have been going on for several years or longer. And these are, these are areas that we need to look at in a, over a, a longer period of time to think about how change happens. Um, I have a guiding question that I use in my work quite broadly, and I, I adapted it from the well-known sociologist Anne Oakley uh, from the UK. And she asked the question in about 1994, uh, what would it really mean to study the world of young people both as knowers and as actors? As knowers and as actors. And I love that question. I think when we look at climate change and we think of uh, the Greta Thunbergs of the world on climate change, uh, if we think of girls' education and Malala, uh, knowers and actors, we think about this notion of how young people are, are totally invested and need to be invested and need to be listened to in the context of issues that are so important to their lives but to the planet more broadly. So I have that question, what would it really mean to study the world of young people, both as knowers and actors? And we're going to listen to a tiny little video from Matthew, uh, a 16-year-old uh, young man from Cape Town, or from Atlantis, just outside of Cape Town. And, and I hope the sound will work on this. Um, this, is what, this is what Matthew says. I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is this whole thing about your sexuality. Who you are, when am I ready for sex? Should I do it? Shouldn't I? They thrown like the whole subject of sex like in our face and how we have to deal with it. And in between that we still have to find out who we are too, so it's like kind of complicated. This complicates life. Yes. Um, now, 
I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is this whole thing about the... I'm just trying to go back to my slides here. I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is... Sorry. We will get there. I think the biggest, one of the biggest... Ah, so, after that little botch, the main point is it's complicated. What would it really mean? It's complicated. Um, this is a, a, a diagram that two of my colleagues from McGill University, the chair of my department, Dr. Lisa Starr, and uh, Jen Thompson, a postdoc, came up with while we were traveling recently in terms of thinking through how do we look at this complicated matter? And I will ask you to look at the very bottom, which is appropriate for from the ground up participatory tools, because the work that we use in terms of visual methodologies, cell filming, which I'm going to talk about today, photo voice, digital storytelling, theater, drawing, all of these are, they start at the ground. They start with the, the participants and we think about how do we work upward from there? How do we move to understanding? Uh, how can methodologies where people are making and doing and participating, how can that lead to dialogue? How can that lead to changing perspectives? How can that lead to reflection? How can that look at some type of shared meaning making? And then moving up the chart to social change. We know social change is big. Uh, but we know that without dialogue and without perspective and without reflection and without shared meaning making, we are not going to uh, inform policy, change norms and attitudes and change practices. Or alternatively, with those types of activities, dialogue, perspective, reflection, that we lead to informing policy, that it m leads to changing norms and attitudes, that leads to changing practices. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, one main methodology that we have particularly, I think, uh, spent a lot of time pioneering and adapting and refining in the Participatory Cultures Lab and also at the Center for Visual Methodologies for Social Change, which is around the use of cell filming. Very simply, what could you do with your cell phone besides uh, call someone or access um, social media in some way, um, that the cell phone itself can become a tool for social change in terms of creation, art production, meaning making, dialogue, sharing, and ultimately reaching other audiences. Um, I'm going to look at a, a little bit of a definition, what's a cell film? Uh, we also we have a, a cell film festival at McGill every year. A cell film is just a very short video, typically 30 to 90 seconds long. Um, it's usually conveying a social message and it, or addressing a social issue. Now obviously you can use a cell phone for many other types of messages, but the way we use cell filming in our lab is to really think through, if you took a, a group of young people or a group of any group, any age, and said, identify the issue that you want to address, what could you do with that? What messages would you make? How would you create that? How would you discuss it? How would you uh, reflect on it? Um, that is the sort of the beginning or the, the beginning of a long process of moving up from, from making to, to meaning making to social change. I'm going to show you two little cell films right now. Uh, the first one uh, is in Portuguese. Uh, it was made in uh, Maputo in Mozambique. Uh, it has English subtitles and it's about 23 seconds long, so don't miss it, you have to listen carefully. And it came out of a workshop that I was doing with a group of um, teacher educators and beginning teachers who were all concerned with gender and gender-based violence. And in our workshop, which went on for about four or five days, we decided that we were going to create media messages. So if you could create a media message about gender-based violence, what would it be? The first example that I'm going to show you uh, was made by four young men. So remember the idea of boys and men as allies and champions. These are four young men who are between the ages of 18 and 20, and they are uh, formadora. They are the, they are the, I think that's correct, the student teachers, uh, and they are talking about the possibility of um, 
teachers, their instructors perhaps abusing their powers in terms of uh, sexual violence. So let's just take a look at this and see if it will work. Colega, ei, colega, tô feliz. Consegui aquela minha aluna da turma E. Aquela clarinha? Aquela é minha. Parabéns. Colega, já ouvi a vossa conversa. Assédio sexual nas escolas é um crime. Não. 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 I see we're going to do this. This is going to be... Uh, greetings, Mama Aja. Good morning. I am Mr. here to be the bride bride of your daughter, to be my fifth wife. No, she's too young. But yes, I'm too young. She's too young. She's too young. I am too young. She's too young. Yes, she's too young. Say, Say no, no to early marriage. marriage. Those two examples, um, the second one, actually, it, it, it arrived faster than it was supposed to. Uh, the second one is from Sierra Leone, and it actually comes out of a workshop that I conducted about four weeks ago, where, again, we had teacher educators and beginning teachers in the same room making small cell films usually in their own group. So the teacher educators creating theirs, the, the students creating theirs, to think about what are the key sexual and reproductive health rights. And there the message was really around uh, early marriage and how do we avoid early marriage. Now, and how, what, what processes need to take place. The production is complicated, but it goes on. So these are not just, okay, we've made a cell film, it's finished, or we've created a photo and it's finished, we get into the reflexive process. What did you like best about your own cell film? What was your reaction to all the ideas and topics presented in the other cell films? Because remember, these are often groups of 40 and 50 people, and there might be 15 cell films presented at one time. If you were going to do your cell film over again, what would you do differently? So, thinking through how do we rehearse for change? How do we think of this as something that is not just a once-off, but we move on? And critically, as an activist, as a social change agent, who should see these films and how can they see them? So thinking of audience, why do we do this work? Who do we want to reach? What's the message we want them to have? These questions to me are very important ones because they speak, I think, to the, the critical questions and the reflexive questions and the thinking that, we, that, that is so important to consider how do we, how do we combat or how do we disrupt what the, the, the every, everyday gender norms. Sometimes, sometimes the cell films that are produced could actually be more harmful or at least as harmful as the very uh, steps or the very um, situation in the first place. And I'm, I'm thinking of um, the situation of HIV and AIDS in South Africa a few years ago, um, where we worked with young people to take photographs. And if you see the, the photograph of the young man um, and the caption, he could not accept that he has HIV positive. He decided to beat the furniture, to the, pardon me, the female to silence her because the girl is willing to reveal their HIV status. I showed that picture because when we did a set of cell films with a group of teachers about sexual and reproductive health rights and challenges to addressing HIV and AIDS, many of, the, many of their cell films were highly moralistic. They were, they were no, but it wasn't the no that we heard earlier from the young men, it was no. Young people shouldn't be having sex. They should be abstaining from sex. And they wrote, they made short cell films that were all about abstaining from sex. And as a team of researchers, we're like, oh, what are we, this is a little bit alarming. How do we take this forward? But we are participatory researchers. We don't want to impose uh, a particular view. So we kept showing the videos over and over again and then we decided to show the, the pictures that 
young people had taken in uh, like the one that you see on the right and had the teachers just look at those pictures the one where the boy is striking the girl there were others there was actually a picture of a young man who was role-playing hanging himself uh, which I would not show in this audience uh, but it's it was terrifying to think about how how um, urgent this issue is and here is a group of teachers making cell films about no 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 well after the teachers spent some time looking at the photographs again and thinking about uh, their role I can say truthfully that that what would you do differently was absolutely key they did do they made new cell films and their new cell films did not have those moralistic messages. They still had, they're still adults, we're teachers, we're responsible, but they were beginning to take into consideration, no, young people in our midst are too important to not have messages that are going to support them. So I see it again as a process, and that's the kind of work we do. We talk, we look, we listen, um, think again, speak back, sometimes to the, the issues as they might uh, appear. And I'm just going to look at one more little piece in this section, because uh, this was a, a workshop specifically on gender and leadership. And I actually just wanted you to look at it. It was a project with uh, young people and um, agricultural workers from, uh, from Ethiopia and Botswana and South Africa who came together to talk about gender and leadership. But again, you can see they're taking pictures, they are, uh, everybody's working together. Uh, for those of you who are uh, interested in data analysis, uh, if you look at the very bottom picture where everybody is standing, on, they've, they've got a whole pile of photographs all over the floor, that's how they're analyzing their own data. They are putting it into, th they're doing thematic coding, they're moving it around, they're saying, oh, this is what I think these pictures mean. Again, a very, like a social engagement around the process itself. So this sort of a, gives you a bit of a picture of the kind of work that um, I, I see as being very critical to how we see it and what would it mean to listen to young people as actors and knowers. But then we go on. And in the next couple of slides, I want to look at the idea of what I call beyond the workshop. Because everything that I've showed you so far, these are in groups where we all come together three or four days, we talk, and all of the things that I've, and we view, and we listen to each other. But most of the time, people aren't in workshops. They go back to real life. They go back to their everyday lives. Maybe they go back to their everyday classrooms. Do they still, how do they bring the messages that we've been talking about? What do they do with them? So the more I do this work, I become more and more interested in what happens next? What happens beyond the workshop? So I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples of what happens beyond the workshop and how to document that. So the first one, um, Taking ownership of the issues. It's not enough to just make a cell film that says, no, no, no. What would you do with it? And remember I mentioned we talk in the workshops about who should see this, where, what audiences would be appropriate. And I want to talk just for a few, min few minutes about a group of girls in Eastern Cape, South Africa, who had been part of a project for three or four years. So these are, these are not just a once-off workshop. But they, they decided that if they were going to do work on gender-based violence, they actually should find out how do you report rape? And could they make a video about it? Because if they could make a video about it, uh, there probably somewhere in social media there is a video about how to report rape in an appropriate language in South Africa, but they had not been able to find it. So they, they, they thought this would be very easy. They started brainstorming and storyboarding how to report rape. And then they realized actually they didn't know how to report rape. They, were, they weren't sure what do you do, what are the steps? Um, so they started to interview police officers. They interviewed nurses in the community. They interviewed the principal in their school. 
Um, and they came up with a, a, a three-minute video that had all of the makings of a lo in a local language, in Koza in this case, uh, a local language that they could use. And they had them on, they have these cell films on their cell phones. And although not everyone in the world has a cell phone, uh, a high percentage of young people do have access to cell phones, even in rural South Africa. And they were starting to use their own cell phone to reach one person at a time. Um, one young girl says, I showed my cell film, in this case they called it Rape is Real, to my parents. My mother said she was very happy. I was learning about this. She said she knew nothing about how to report rape when she was my age. Um, she also goes on to talk about how she showed it to neighbors. And people were like, oh, we didn't know you, we didn't know this. Either we didn't know this, as in we didn't know this information, or we didn't know that you knew this. And either one, I think, is a very important aspect of how we think about uh, the young people around us and what they know, knowers and actors. Uh, the same group, and it, it actually came, this came out of a, of a focus group with seven, seven girls. Um, they also talked about who else should see their cell films, and they said, well, I would like, to, I would like to, um, police officers to see th these cell films because they're the people we report the cases to. We as a group should go to our community police station and present our work. I think the police officer will see that we are serious about this. They also went on to talk about, you know, the ward counselors and uh, their own teachers should know this. And I'm thinking about this notion of agency, actors, knowers, feeling that you can do this uh, as being a tremendous part of this notion of how do we think about social change. Um, in another context, and this is back to Sierra Leone, um, we spent, as I mentioned earlier, four or five days making, making cell films about sexual and reproductive health rights. We got on a plane on, Mon on a Sunday, and by Monday, we had, my colleagues and I, had a WhatsApp account set up with everybody who was at the workshop. And WhatsApp uh, definitely is the, the preferred media platform, social media platform in most parts of Africa. By the time we had got back to Montreal, we had a WhatsApp box full of cell films that participants had made on their own because they had been so inspired and on topics that we hadn't actually dealt with in the, in the workshop. We had dealt with some aspects of gender-based violence, we had looked at school-based school violence, when we were brainstorming, a couple of girls and young women had mentioned female genital mutilation came, coming from them, but we didn't actually make, we didn't actually make any uh, film, cell films at that workshop. They went back to their, their dorm, uh, to one, one of the colleges, and there were only three uh, in that group that you see at the bottom who were actually at the workshop, but that they taught their colleagues how to make a cell film in 24 hours. Uh, you can see an example of their storyboard where they, one of, the, one of the things that we talked about is how do you map it out? How do you plan out the story? What's the title? How does it begin? How does it end? Uh, you can even see a chart where they did brainstorming. And they sent, they sent all of this to us on, on, on WhatsApp. So they, did, they, they had so internalized the process, it isn't just making the self film, you brainstorm, you storyboard, you have a title, you have credits. They also have their credits at the bottom of their, uh, uh, bottom of their storyboard. And they, they demonstrated, I think, and they continue to. We can, this is like now four weeks later, and we are still getting cell films on WhatsApp that are being distributed to other people in the group, but it also means that anyone in that group can share it in their community, they can share it with other students, they can share it with colleagues. So this idea that it is, you do not wait for someone else, that the, the change is there and it's with you. So this notion of what happens after the workshop, I think is really, really critical. Um, one other one that I, I apologize that I, I did not make the, 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 the lettering bigger here, but um, we did a project in, in India just before COVID 
where youth, again, were, they were learning how to make cell films. They were also using photography to talk about sexual and reproductive health rights. They would bring up menstrual hygiene management. They would talk about, um, uh, they would talk about early marriage, forced marriage, gender violence. Um, and everyone in that group, because it, it, the project was funded through um, uh, IDRC, which is a Canadian, and Oxfam Canada, all of the youth in the project received cell phones forever. They, they had them to use in the workshop, but they could keep them forever. And what was very interesting is uh, that workshop was in June, July of 2019. They were meant to do some workshops in, the, in November and December and continue on into March and April and May. But of course, guess what happened in March and April and May? Um, India, like every other country, was in dire straits in terms of COVID-19. What was so interesting is the youth were meant to come back together into facilitated workshops, but they couldn't. But they continued to make cell films on their own. And we were able to, to collect some testimonials from them later about how they would go into the village where they lived, that they would be trying to convince someone uh, that they should send their daughter to school, uh, that they should be, a, should be concerned about menstrual hygiene management. And one young man says, you know, people now understand the superstitious uh, uh, ceremonies. Uh, they were making fun of us at first. Why are you going around talking, talking about menstrual hygiene management? Like, what is that? And talked about how people, oh, yeah, we should be doing things. We should start doing things. So that idea of actors, knowers become actors, being able to, to do this kind of work. Um, we've also seen some remarkable examples of going from making cell films, doing photo boys or making digital stories into other media forms. And the two that are on um, the screen right now both come from uh, two indigenous communities in Canada. On the left, uh, from Eskasoni, which is on the east coast of Canada in Nova Scotia, um, the youth there who had been part of a project called Networks for Change for several years decided that they had been spending, they'd been doing a lot of work around the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Canada as a really serious critical issue. Uh, they created a memorial garden. Uh, the garden in the photographs that I have right now are, it's just in progress, uh, but they've planted, they've planted sage, they've planted um, various indigenous um, uh, herbs and they're, they're it's, it's, it's a space where everyone can begin to think about uh, how they might look at every day, how they might think about every day about the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. On the right side is a, um, a mural on Broadway Street in the middle of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It's called uh, Creator Save the Matriarch and it was made by a group of indigenous girls who had been part of Networks for Change and they made it during COVID because they couldn't actually meet inside, they had workshops outside, and they decided that to do something like cell filming or photo voice, something that they'd already done, would be rather difficult and that they should really be working outside. So they now have this amazing mural. There's a beautiful video. If anyone is interested, I would love to share. It's a 12 minute video, so I didn't uh, choose it for today. But the idea of knowing that we need to bring attention to um, the situation and acting. And people can't walk down Broadway in Saskatoon without looking up at this mural and without thinking about it uh, and actually thinking about the, the issues that are being raised. So again, thinking about this idea of, of the making into the knowing, into the acting and reaching out to audiences far beyond ourselves. Well, in the third part of this presentation, I want to consider the question, which is the one that people ask me all the time. So, does anything change? Uh, what difference does this make? These are projects, a workshop here, a workshop there, what happens next? I've given you some examples of, of how people have taken these ideas and have done something after the workshop, but what about in the bigger picture of work around gender-based violence? 
and bigger pictures around sexual and reproductive health rights. So I have a couple of different answers to the does anything change. Uh, this is a, an example of a, a, a themed issue of a journal in South Africa that my colleague Rayla Wahili uh, Molitsani and I guest edited last year called Girl Led from the Ground Up Approaches to Policy Dialogue and Policy Change. We just started collecting, trying to find examples so that there is documentation and hope for the ideas. So there's lots of writing that you could look at, but I want to look at a couple of examples of, of what this might look like. Um, this is an example of a girl festo. You won't be able to read any of the print of it, but hopefully you can read the, the um, title. And it actually comes out of a, a workshop that we conducted with girls and young women from Networks for Change uh, two years ago or three years ago, where they, we, we organized the workshop in such a way that they could think about how do you develop uh, a declaration or a platform for action. They didn't want to call it a manifesto. They thought a manifesto sounds way too patriarchal. Can we call it a girl festo? And the girl festo, which is now translated into about 15 languages, including Inuktitut, uh, Cree, um, several local languages like Ekoza, it is a Zulu, Russian, Swedish. Uh, everybody who was represented at the workshop has a girl festo in that language, plus we have more. But it's this idea of how do we see it? What's the situation? What do we need to do? Or what can we do as young people? And what do we need from adults? And really, isn't that about activism and social change? What, do we, what is the situation? And so they very, very carefully uh, documented what the situation is for, on gender-based violence for them. And they, and, and they say, we want freedom, not just safety. Um, but what can we do? And, and many of their suggestions were, they talk, you know, we, can, we can talk to our parents, we can talk to our friends, we can try to convince other people, we can make art and show it. Um, but what do we need from other people? And some of the things that the girls said, I think are very important. One of the things they said is we need sexual and reproductive health rights education in a multilingual format. We, nobody should be learning about their own sexuality in a language other than their first language where possible. So they talked about the significance, which in, in the context of Canada, language revitalization, in the context of South Africa, so many uh, African languages are there, but the curriculum is not always in all of those languages. So they talked about language. They talked about, we would like to have more boys and men involved in this project, in these projects. So girls inform adults that they should have more boys and young men. They also talked about, we need more funding and support for arts-based work. We don't just want curriculum. We want to be making, but we need support to do that. So those are just some examples of, of thinking what they could do, but also what they needed to do something else. Um, in a project that we worked on in uh, South Africa, everyone learned how to write an action brief. If you are in policy, or if you are in, as I know there's a group of people in here in social work and maybe policy or education and policy, maybe you only learn how to do an action brief when you are uh, graduating or moving on to work for a ministry. If you're 14, can you write an action brief? Why not? What would it look like? How do you document the issues? This was uh, related to uh, making safe campuses um, in, uh, at uh, the University of Nelson Mandela. And the girls and young women there took many, they created a lot of photo voice projects where they saw that, that often the people who are supposed to be the people protecting them are the people who are the perpetrators of violence. So their action brief was about sexual harassment by security staff. We are the victims of our protectors. Uh, who could we trust? They created these action briefs and to the credit of my dear colleague, Professor Nadine DeLonga, who sat at a very high level at the university as a chair, was able to use her power as an adult to make sure that the young women could present their action briefs at various uh, meetings with the, the head of 
security services, for the residence services, uh, for the deputy deans and so on. So kind of recognizing that very often we need to understand what the power structures are and not everyone will know that if they're 14 or 15 or 16 or maybe much older. But we need, we need that we need, and you need to have some sort of a platform so that their action briefs look very polished by the time they were uh, presented to um, the policymakers. This is an example also from South Africa where when we first met with a group of young women, girls and young women, to brainstorm ideas for a cell film and storyboard ideas for a cell film, their ideas were to think about forced and early marriage. And it was very interesting, although my colleagues with whom I work in South Africa are obviously very familiar with the critical issues, they hadn't seen in that district that forced and early marriage was so prevalent. And when the girls started making uh, posters called, you know, vows for cows, how to get rid of, you know, forced early marriage, people really started thinking, this, this, this is serious. Um, the girls, they're called, they called themselves the social ills fighters. They created um, uh, a video, which you can just see in the top corner, where abduction was a huge issue of forced and early marriage. They had, they made the cell film, they had, community marches, they had community dialogue, and at the community dialogue events, that's where things really started to change. The adults in the room, the teachers, the principal, parents, the chief, said, we have to do something. And it's very interesting, the chief of that community, when we first approached him to do work in that community, said, well, you can come and do this, but I don't want anything to change. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but he was one of the people who led a delegation to Peter Maritzburg to present a briefs, uh, action briefs, not drawn up by the girls, but drawn up by the community, and with the help of the research team, to say, we need to do something about forced and early marriage in this district. We need to raise awareness amongst the parents, and we need to actually make it something that people take seriously. It's now called the Lost Cop Protocol. Uh, and if you go onto the IDRC website and just Google forced and early marriage in South Africa, this, the whole story will come up. Uh, it took about four years. The girls made their cell film in about 2016 about abduction. Marches, community dialogue, community dialogue, more community dialogue, on March, the, I'd say it was like March the 12th, 2020, the Lost Cop Protocol was passed in the Peter, Peter Maritzburg, uh, the legislature of KZN in Peter Maritzburg. Um, those girls weren't there. Uh, it was the adult's responsibility to take that on. But of course, it's gone back to the girls. They were like celebrating uh, hugely. But the idea, does anything change? What difference can this make? how to think about the policy-making aspect of this as being a really critical part. Um, I'm winding down. I have a couple more examples. Um, one, I, I would call it passing the torch, perhaps. Uh, but I started a project in um, Cape Town, uh, Atlantis and Kaya Leach in Cape Town in 2002, working with a group of young people on AIDS activism. You met Matthew at the very beginning. He said, it's kind of complicated. When Matthew said, he, that was in 2003, for a, a range of wonderful circumstances, I have been able to stay in touch with that group for 20 years. Uh, with my colleague Shannon Walsh, who teaches at UBC, she's a filmmaker. Uh, and we, we kept meeting with them periodically, 2003, 2004, 2006, and we kept thinking it was the end of the project. Uh, but then we would get new funding or there would be something where we could still continue to talk with these young people. And they, were, they met in the first place as AIDS activists working for the Treatment Action Campaign. When we started working in the project, uh, they were going into schools doing peer, peer counseling, they were doing presentations, there were a group of about 14 of them. Over the years, 
of course, they're no longer 15 and 16. They're 30. They're in their 30s. They're like 35 and 36 and 37, approximately. And it's been very interesting to follow, to study activism over a 20-year period. Not everyone is out there campaigning, but everyone in some way, one person's a social worker. And honestly, the story of Taylene and her life as a social worker is remarkable. We kept, trans we kept recording every time we met with them, so we kept transcripts from this entire period of time. What does it mean to become a social worker? What does it mean to become a nurse? What does it become to mean to be a, a, an actor or a dancer or a filmmaker? Um, on December the 2nd, I guess that's in a couple of days, I'm going to South Africa to the launch of a book that we've just co-written called In My Life, uh, Stories uh, from Young Activists in South Africa 2002 to 2022. Um, and the, the, the youth who are now adults all have chapters in this book as well. But one of the key things, and the reason I'm not just telling you this because I'm very proud of the fact that we're going to have a book launch for World AIDS Day, but that every time we've met with them, and the last time we had a face-to-face -face meeting was in 2019, they said things like, we really need to get other young people involved. Take them away from everything, fill them with ideas, give them hope for a bright future, uh, so that they, when they go back to their homes, they, they can spread to others, they can share that drive uh, to do something better in life. Uh, and Matthew himself says, I had no idea what it would be like to be empowered as a young person, but now that's what I want to do with other people. And so I think they've kind of realized that there's this notion of how do we pass things on? How do we, what else can we do? So I'm, I'm very excited. At the launch, we are going to have a group of, um, from Love Life, which is a, an AIDS and gender activist organization of young people now, they're 15 and 16 or younger, who will be there as well. So it's that idea of how do we think about passing the torch does anything change? It can change. In the group that uh, we've, I've been working with in uh, Eskasoni and also in Rankin Inlet, which is in the north of Nunavut in Canada, uh, and in Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan, uh, we started a couple of years ago a new project in which the older girls would become mentors to younger girls. And we called them Gen 1 and Gen 2. So the Gen 1 girls are now 19 and 20, the Gen 2 girls are coming along as 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds, and this idea of how do you think about this intergenerationality? I know those are not long generations, and we're maybe thinking of generation as 20 years. These are like six years. But the, in the life of young people in a small community, that notion of generation, I think, is very specific, and we think about it in a much different way. So this idea of how are they how are they mentoring and bringing along others? But I also want to talk about something about the Canadian government. Canada has a very complicated history in relation to its indigenous peoples, like several other countries. And this work, I think, is very, it's, it's very, we're finally thinking, seeing action, a more action-oriented agenda uh, in 2015, Murray Sinclair, uh, as a Chief Justice, brought for, forward, after a lot of consultation, something called the 94 Calls to Action. And universities have, have particular calls to action to, in, to you know, hire more Indigenous staff, to indigenize the curriculum. Uh, schools have particular calls to action. But one of the calls to action that has had almost no action has been number 66. Number 66 says, we call upon the, this was written in 2015, we call upon the federal government to establish multi-year funding for community-based youth organizations to deliver programs on reconciliation and establish a national network to share information and best practices. Well, the group that you see at the top are the Young Indigenous Women's Utopia from uh, Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan. Two of them. Um, this, 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 this was part of a video, a cell film they made in, I think, 2016, so they're much older. But two of them spent last Thursday and Friday in Ottawa with about 30 other young people from different organizations across Canada, lobbying Senate 
about call to action number 66. How are we going to fund youth groups so that the projects that I've spoken about so far have all been funded, led by me, led by McGill, led by adults, led by often mostly non-Indigenous adults, but with Indigenous communities. This is something different. This is saying, no, young people should not have to account for their actions and account for their organization and account for their lives as actors and knowers only in response to whether a, a university can raise money for them, but in and of themselves. So there's now a roadmap to uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission call to action number 66. Um, I understand that the talks went very well uh, last week, but the idea of, again, thinking about the girl festo, thinking about the, um, the action briefs, thinking about the marches, thinking about all of these different interventions, starting with this is what we want, to this kind of, I think, national action uh, to think about how the government can be directly responsible to young people and directly uh, answering the need for better programs to support reconciliation and no mediating by uh, a, a university but directly to the organizations. So I, I put that out there as like an example of yes, things can change. I don't want to say our organization or our project was the catalyst, but we were part of it. And the kinds of things that we learned those girls learned and took to that, took to the, to the collective action topic talks uh, with the Senate on last Thursday and Friday. And they were confident. They knew that they, they know what an organization can do and why it should be led by them. So it's like a, and I think an example of how we can think about this. Um, and now I am truly winding down, but I, I don't want to leave without showing you a two minute video. Uh, that comes from Maputo. It's in Portuguese with English subtitles. Uh, and I know there are a lot of teachers and beginning teachers in the room. I know that one of the greatest needs in Portugal right now, because I had such a lovely uh, discussion at the break, is that we need more teachers and we need better trained teachers and we need people who are committed to social change. So I want to show you um, a two minute video that was made uh, in Maputo. Uh, I rarely go around the world being fo followed by a film crew, but this was one case when I was followed by a film crew. Uh, and we conducted some workshops after the workshop that we did earlier where you saw no, 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 uh, that, those, those, those particular youth uh, into this workshop where they're talking about how they feel about uh, the work that they've done and what they would like to do next. So it's two minutes, it's in Portuguese with English subtitles and I think it's a very inspiring ending to think about can anything change, how does it change, how do we think of being knowers and actors. So hopefully this will work. a opção de ser fêmea porque eu faço coisas que as mulheres fazem, pilar amendoim, pilar, pilar amendoim, cozinhar, mas os meus irmãos diziam, olha, você não pode fazer isso porque você é um homem. Mas com aquele vídeo que eu produzi, eu posso levar para minha casa, chegar a mostrar o vídeo, olha, as coisas são assim, a equidade, a equidade do gênero. E eles podem entender que nós todos somos iguais, podemos fazer qualquer coisa, não é que a mulher não pode fazer isso e o homem não. Com o seu filme, eu pude aprender que ainda há necessidade de explorarmos mais esse tema de igualdade de gênero. Assistindo algumas filmagens, eu pude perceber que há necessidade de explorarmos mais esses temas nas escolas. O aluno, nesse momento, vai dizer, lembra do filme que o professor trouxe o que dizia? Então, aqui não há diferença, aqui nós somos iguais. Se é para jogar futebol, todos nós vamos lá jogar futebol. Se é para brincar negra, todos vamos brincar negra. Então, aqui não há diferença. E essa parte que nós queremos que os alunos... Uma vez vendo esse filme, a criança em si pode criar já a coragem de 
transmitir esse conhecimento para os pais. No papel. Mas em algum momento eu fui criativa, implementei mais algumas coisas. Eu era muito insegura para aparecer perante as câmeras, desprezava alguns detalhes mesmo. Então eu descobri muitas qualidades em mim mesma na realização de selfies. Então o meu autoestima melhorou muito. E falando de mim, no papel que eu tive de ser professora, sedutora, é, foi, um papel, <risos> foi um papel engraçado, foi um aprendizado. Eu nunca fui ousada, nunca soube me enquadrar. Eu, como para fazer aquele papel, tinha que eu me encarnar, ser uma outra pessoa. Viajar um pouco. E foi um, meio difícil, mas mesmo assim foi algo para superar. Eu gostei muito de ter feito aquele papel de professora. Em algum momento, nós transmitimos a mensagem ou a informação. Uh, sem ter consentimento da própria transmissão. No sentido do que, se nós já temos um seu filme lá fora, por exemplo, no corredor, começamos a nos chamar pelo, pelo uh, nome tratado no seu filme. O seu filme, em algum momento, uh, pode trazer um impacto na sociedade, mas se formos olhar no, no sentido pedagógico, uh, desenvolve a oralidade entre nós e na, na, nas pessoas que também recebem a própria mensagem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can put my scarf back on. Okay. Congratulations oh, you. because your conference shows us how one can act and uh, uh, and work uh, towards to, to, to change uh, the, the, the world and the situation that are occurring in the world. So uh, it is late, but uh, if you have a question or a comment, please, only one, yes. So only the first one. But it is possible one. If you don't have it, I will have one. <laughs> so I will say, because uh, when I heard about you, I realized that some people um, highlight your persistence. And uh, when we show things like that, uh, I think that uh, you needed to confront uh, some difficulties. How? Do you overcome them, or how do you mitigate them to 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 to, to, be, to become possible things like that that uh, where these uh, uh, young people, young uh, uh, these these girls and this young woman develop her power agency. They talk about their self-esteem and so on. Ooh, that's a very good question and has many answers. Um, I think one of them is actually to make sure that there's a safe space for girls and young women to speak out. Um, that one of the things that we do when we start working in an organization is say, once you start talking about gender-based violence, you can't stop. Uh, you, will have, you will have more cases, you will have more reports than you ever had before and it will look like it is a very unsuccessful project because the numbers will go up, because the consciousness will go up. So one of the challenges is to make sure that there is training and support for the adults around. Uh, we always have to apply obviously for ethical approval and to make sure that there are counselors, but you do not want to do more harm than good. And so the idea of putting, and I should have spent more time talking about that, but the idea of how do you put in safety measures so that you anticipate that there will be more gender-based violence reported once you start talking about it. And people need to be prepared for that, the support, training, and just making sure that the girls themselves are not in a, a more dangerous position. But thank you for that question. It's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uma breve nota, somente para dizer que well, we shall now have the, the lunch break. We are a little bit late out of school, but for, a good, for the best of the reasons, but we'll try to save as much time as possible. For those who won't be with us uh, in the, uh, after lunch, thank you very much for being here. It was a wonderful audience to have you here. And for those who will continue, and I know that many of you will continue, and many other will come, uh, we will try to start as close as possible to, 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 to clock, although perhaps a little bit, uh, let's say 15 minutes after this, so that you can have uh, some extra time for, for the lunch. And now in Portuguese, muito obrigado pela vossa presença. Para aqueles que eventualmente continuem e não possam continuar, recordo que hoje às 7 horas, no Teatro Académico de Gil Vicente, há também um espetáculo eh, muito bonito para o qual os convidamos e eh, naturalmente que eh, as assistências e entradas são abertas e gratuitas. Muito obrigado novamente.